Thank you for being with us today. What a joy to be together. And I want to thank you for being a part of our viewing audience. It's always wonderful to hear from people that send us a text, give a phone call, you call the office, leave a message, or that wonderful blessing of taking time to write a card or a letter. We really, really enjoy those and share them in the office and read them together. And your prayer requests, obviously, we pray over them. I want to encourage you today if you would, to go to our website, ralphsexton.com. We've now released the, the documentary from Israel. As you know, I just returned from the land of Israel, and we are releasing this documentary, The Massacre of My People. And if you'll go to ralphsexton.com, it will link you to our YouTube channel, and that will be Ralph Sexton's YouTube channel, at Ralph Sexton Ministries, and then also it will link you to our Facebook page which is Ralph Sexton Ministries' Facebook page. Both of them will be having this documentary, The Massacre of My People. Well, let's settle in. Let's get our Bibles. Romans chapter 1 will also be in Isaiah chapter number 5. This comes as we take a few weeks to answer some questions that have been asked by our church family. And this is one of the most relevant and most asked questions and it's not just coming from people who go to church or who are Christians, but it's coming from folks of all walks of life, even those who aren't necessarily believers. And they're asking this question, is America under God's judgment? Is God judging America or are we under judgment and are we experiencing the wrath of God as a nation? And this morning, I want to take an opportunity to answer that question and preach a message that will biblically explain and maybe even expand on the idea of God's judgment, his wrath, and where we are as a nation. And my goal is to obviously be obedient to the Lord, but it's for us to always know what the Bible says about God's judgment, his wrath, and maybe even together that we would be able to say with any surety that we find evidence of God's judgment or his wrath poured out on our nation. I'll say this as I did this morning at eight o'clock, this is not to scare anyone. This is not to be sensational or to cause fear. It's not to be something that brings you to a place of anxiety or panic. If you will allow the Holy Ghost to use his word, and if you'll allow God to truly speak to your heart this morning, this will bless you. Remember the truth of God's word always leads to blessing. It will stabilize you and it'll help you to live, to parent, to grandparent, and to be a member of society and a member of the church with the correct biblical worldview about the nation in which you are living. So let's ask the Lord for this to be used, that it would bless us, that it would stabilize us, and that it would penetrate our hearts. Let's very carefully approach scripture this morning with humility and let's uh, with integrity, let's take apart everything that's here for us. You pray with me as we begin. Holy Father, in Jesus' name, once more we gather to preach your word. God, to preach the message you've put in our heart this morning. And Lord, I'm so thankful for the opportunity that we have, God, to gather together under the banner of Jesus Christ and under the truth of your word. And Lord, to take your word apart and to ingest it and to allow it to change our lives. Lord, I pray for just a few moments that you'd help me now. Lord, I'm nothing without you. I don't have the capacity or the capability to preach what you've put in my heart. But Lord, if you'll help me as your servant, hide me behind the cross and God fill me with the words that I would say and keep me from the words I shouldn't, then Lord will be faithful to give you all the praise, all the glory and all the honor for what's done in this place. Touch us now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Now for this church, especially the members of this church, we do not have to talk a lot this morning about where we are as a people. And when I say people, I mean a nation, the, the nation of the United States of America. It would not be worth the time to list out all the turning away and all of the rebellion that's prevalent in our culture. And in many ways, if we'll pay close attention, we'll realize that our culture is failing. We're living in a reality that we can find in Isaiah chapter 5, verse number 20. This leans into the six woes of Israel. This is one of the principles that we find of God. It says, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. 
Understand this one thing now in this moment, and this will serve as a quick answer to the question that's being asked. Understand, church, that the United States of America nationally is under divine judgment. The United States, our country, the red, white, and blue, that nationally we are absolutely under divine judgment. The woe of calling evil good and good evil, which is exactly the inversion of our sick culture and the wrath and the judgment of a holy God has now come. But before we decide to blame a political party, or before we decide to blame a system of government for all that's taking place in our nation, understand that there is a higher power. There is a greater force than anything that Washington, D.C. possesses. There is a higher office than that of the Oval Office. There is a stronger force than that of our three branches of government. The legislative, the judicial, and the executive capacities of our democratic republic, it's a wonderful idea. It's something that the founders, no doubt, had right that those three branches of government would work and operate in unison and that it would be under the idea that God is superior to all. We are far, far away from those days, friend. But realize even in its greatest capacities, those three branches of government and the Oval Office and the power that it represents, that it comes not even close to the power, the authority, and the supremacy of our God. The White House may represent the most powerful man on earth, but it's only the most powerful man on earth in the world standard. There is a greater power, there is a greater force who according to Romans chapter 13 ordains all structure and all government and all authority over all people in the world. Psalm 99 verse number one, it says this, the Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. He sitteth between the cherubims, let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion and he is high above all the people. Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., the 46th president of the United States. Donald John Trump, the 45th president of the United States. Barack Hussein Obama, the 44th president of the United States, and even George, no middle name Washington, the very first president of the United States, have never in any of their capacities or their authorities had a power and a supremacy over God. God has always been in charge. God has always been more powerful. And the Bible says that the Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. There is something greater than what we find in Raleigh. There's something greater than what we find in D.C. There's something greater than what's here in Buncombe County. There's something greater that rules over the the, the Asheville sphere of control. And it is God himself. The President of the United States may be a powerful man, but it is nothing compared to God. You can have the greatest armies. You can have the greatest military. You can have nuclear capability. God loves laughs at your nuclear weapons. God can swallow up in one instance of thought your nuclear power and slay you from generation to generation. God is greater than anything that we have ever experienced within the constructs of the United States of America. The Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. He answers, he bends, he bows, and he breaks for no one. That's who our God is. To not love him and to not fear him and to not obey him comes with consequence. It's a high price to ignore God. And now the United States is paying that price. The Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. They say, Pastor, how do we know? What is the biblical proof that are we under divine judgment as a nation? Romans chapter 1, go down to the 18th verse. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Against what? Against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. 
The wrath of God revealed. There are many different ways that the wrath of God is revealed and even carried out. But we have to say here that the most graphic manifestation of God's holy wrath and the most graphic manifestation of God's hatred for sin was when God poured out divine judgment on his son Jesus Christ on the cross and he took all of your hell and all of your wrath and all of your torment that was meant for you for all of eternity. God hates sin so much and God is not a communist. He must pay the price justly and he did so in the life and the body of his own darling precious son the Lord Jesus Christ he did so for you and he did so for me for Jesus Christ was sinless Jesus Christ was perfect but someone had to pay the wage of sin and the wage of sin is death that's how much God regards sin that's how much God hates sin that he was willing to pour out wrath intended for you on his son that he that so that he could close the great chasm between you and a holy God and what he did to his son on your behalf ought to at least cause you to pause this morning and look towards heaven and say, Jesus, thank you for becoming my sin on my cross. Jesus, thank you for taking the wrath poured out that should have been for me that you received on the cross. It was so horrible. It was so terrible what took place that God shrouded the earth in darkness. And for hours, Jesus was on the cross hanging there and God the Father poured out all that wrath and all that hate of sin on his sinless, perfect son so that you didn't have to die and go to hell. What a God, what a Savior. Christ becoming my sin on the cross was a head-on collision with the wrath and the hatred of God. And it was poured out on our Lord Jesus who hung there on your behalf and on my behalf. It was not his doings. It was not his sin. It was my sin. But God's wrath, folks, is serious. This is nothing light. This is nothing to just look over. This is serious because God's hatred for sin is serious. God hates sin. That's why people go to hell with sin unforgiven. It cannot be allowed into his kingdom and God will punish. The wages of sin is death. God hates sin. And in his wrath, it operates in five forms. There are four, five capacities that we find in the New Testament, especially, and, and even places in the Old Testament that, that put all of this together. Five different types of wrath. Number one is eternal wrath, and that's hell. Number two is prophetic wrath, wrath of prophecy. And this is the final day of the Lord that is to come. Thirdly, there's cataclysmic wrath. That's major floods and earthquakes and natural disasters. Number four, and we'll come back to this maybe even soon, there's consequential wrath. This is the law of sowing and reaping. Whatever you sow in your garden, you will reap that in your garden. If you plant cucumbers, you will get cucumbers. If you plant cantaloupe, you'll get cantaloupe. If you plant a row of corn, guess what you're going to get? A row of corn. And if you sow the seeds of hell in your garden, then you will reap in your garden a harvest of hell. The, the, the law of sowing and reaping never takes a break. And even in the life of saved people who are saved, sanctified, and awaiting glorification, your flesh can sow seeds of wrath, can sow seeds of hell in your life. And the principle, the law of sowing and reaping is still true. It's always true. But lastly, the fifth type of wrath is the wrath of abandonment. The removing of restraint and the letting people go into their sins. And what we find here in Romans chapter 1 verse 18 is exactly that type of wrath. This is the wrath of abandonment. That might be one of the most terrifying realities in all of Scripture that eventually God will let the sinner get exactly what the sinner wants. The deepest, darkest desires that lead to his wrath and God lets them go and God lets them have it. And truly quite terrifying, this leads to eternal damnation. The human condition unleashed. It goes to the most radical places of potential. And it's exactly what you're seeing in your world. We keep saying to each other, especially in private conversation, why are things getting so bad? Why are things getting so dark? Why, why are we so far removed from the days of what it was even in the 1950s with morality? We're not talking about the spiritual condition of the church. We're just talking about you could walk down the street and have a $100 bill in your pocket and go home with that $100 bill in your pocket. Now you can't walk down the street in Asheville without locking up your money and having a gun on you and walking with your eyes wide open and, and, and being accosted is a normal thing now, even in this little mountain town and county. 
Things are different. Music and culture and movies and even the identity of gender and, and all the things that are happening in our world. How are we getting to this place so quickly and so radically dark? It's through the wrath of abandonment. It's people getting exactly what they want. Abandoned souls, demonically possessed and directed to fulfill the dark lusts of their unregenerate hearts. And it's hearts that aren't just uh, nonchalant or indifferent towards God. They are hearts that hate God. There's a genuine hate for God in our land that's never been realized to this level. There is a hatred for truth and there is a hatred for light in a way that's hard to imagine. That's the world we're living in. And this is evident continually through history that God allows wicked, unregenerate men and women to pursue their sin and then to get the consequence of that. And if you go back in history and you look, most of these examples lead to the fall of a nation. They lead to the collapse of society and eventually the overthrowing of the ruling and elite class. And church family, again, this leads to blessing. This leads to encouragement. But you hear me, I believe with all of my heart that this is where we are. I believe this perfectly describes where we are as a people. God has been so good to the United States of America. He has richly blessed us. He's given to us beyond anything we could ever deserve as a nation. And even in common grace, God has been good. But instead of a national awareness and a national turning to him, we rejected him. And we've turned to our own desires. Our leaders from top to bottom, for the most part, those that are lifelong politicians, you hear me now, most of them have sold this country out. We are more possessed by the Chinese communists than we ever have been, and we will be so next week when the sun settles Friday in Washington. They have sold our nation, and they have sold their soul for power and for control and for a dollar, for the sake of power. And it is the bloodthirst and it is the lust of demonically controlled people who are getting what they want. But you hear me, it will lead to our undoing. July the 4th, 1776, the signing, the day, the moment freedom rang loudly was 247 years, 10 months, and 15 days ago, which is 90,534 days. Church, you hear me, the United States of America is an infant. We are babies on the world scale of history. The Jewish people have a recorded history that goes back 5,000 years. 5,000 years of recorded history. We're 247 years old. That means that as of today, American history is exactly 4.94% of what's recorded in Jewish history. America is young. America is rich America is volatile and America is rebellious. And because of all of that, we are under divine judgment. Judgment that, again, I truly believe will lead to its fall. Our demise is set before us if we'll just pay attention. And just as the Roman Empire fell with all of its power and might, wealth, influence, prosperity. The Roman Empire fell. It crumbled. How? Not from an adversary without. It happened from within. Total collapse of everything that was ordained for order and for structure. It led to their fall. And truly, you might be offended by that or you might feel that that goes too far. It's just simple, basic Bible truth. You say it's too harsh. It's too bitter for me to swallow. You hear me now, brother in Christ, sister in Christ, hear me clearly. You cannot explain God away with human emotions. He does not operate in knee-jerk, emotional, reactionary cycles that human beings operate in. God is not just lavishly overreacting to the nature of our country. This is, a, this is not an impulsive outburst of anger aimed erratically at people that God does not like. God's wrath and his judgment is settled. It's determined. And it's a determined response of a righteous God. If God does not respond to sin in this light, he is not God. If we would read the Bible clearly, we would see that. 
Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God was revealed from heaven against what? All ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Wrath against what? Take your, take your highlighter, your pen, underline ungodliness. Ungodliness, this is an indication of a lack of reverence, a lack of devotion, and a lack of worship of God. This proves a defective relationship with God. Have, have you looked closely at America lately? Where do we find our standing with reverence with the things of God? Where do we find our devotion to God on a national basis? Again, we are not talking about the church. All the Christians say amen, so I know I have your attention. Amen. We're not talking about the church. We're talking about the nation. Where are we as a nation as it pertains to ungodliness? We are ungodly. From top to bottom, the, the, the exchange between the two congresswomen of our country this week was an absolute disgrace. Talking about eyelashes and talking about a, a body type. What in the world? You know what that is? You know what that confusion is? You know what the weak leadership of our nation is? It is the judgment and the wrath of God poured out on a group of people who had it so good. God had been so good to us over and over and over. And now we have a death grip on the very thing that's going to cause our country to fall. And we'll say, this is what I want. This is what I need. This is what we have to have. This is new American liberty. This is new American identity. And it'll cause our demise, not from without, but from within. Ungodliness is who we are, and ungodliness leads to unrighteousness. This is the result of ungodliness. We have bred generation after generation who slowly but surely cut off any devotion or respect for the things of God. My own grandfather tells me that in this town, you used to not be able to buy beer on Sunday out of respect for the things of God. That the drunks from Saturday night would hide their beer cans as God's people went to church on Sunday morning because of the respect and devotion for the things of God, even if they weren't believers. Those days are gone. And we've embraced a hatred for the things of God. We've, re we've really replaced authority in any sense with radical humanism in the most dark, wicked way. And we are getting exactly what we want. So wrath is poured out not against the Democratic Party. Don't get this wrong. Quit blaming the Democrats. Start blaming the devil. Quit blaming the Republicans who won't do X, Y, and Z. Start realizing what it is. Get you some common sense. This is not political. This is spiritual. And there are dozens of people, bad actors, hear me now, in love. I want this to help you today. The election is coming and we have to be sure-footed in our stance. Where we are as a nation has more to do with the homes of America than it has to do with Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C. is a result of what's happening in the homes and a result of what's been allowed to happen in the schools. You've allowed pagans to teach our children what gender is and confuse their little minds. You've allowed homosexuals with an agenda to groom a generation to prepare them for hell and the church has remained silent. Quit blaming the Democrats and look in the mirror. It's on us. The judgment and the wrath of God is poured out because of the conduct of the people. And now we are set on a trajectory with leaders who are weak. Leaders who are under the influence of Satan himself. Leaders who are under demonic control. And they are slow marching America off the cliff. And the church wants to play games. And the church wants to backbite. And the church wants to fuss. And the church wants to complain about another deacon or another member of the church or the, the sound system's too loud or the choir didn't sing my song. And we're, we're rocked to sleep by our foolishness while the world's in judgment and the world's going to hell and the church, when it should be full of power and full of prayer and full of preaching, pulling people out of the fire, we're rocked to sleep with the silly things of this world that do not matter. Are we under judgment in this country? Yes. Why? Because God is holy and God is pouring out his wrath on ungodliness and unrighteousness. And then he says, those that hold the truth and unrighteousness. 
These are people who know. They have either an instance in their life where they heard the gospel or they know that the Bible is a place of authority or someone's preached to them or someone's taught them and instead of receiving the truth of God's word, they've turned their backs on it and they possess the truth or they hold the truth, but they hold it in unrighteousness. It's rebellion towards God. It's like an unto witchcraft. And our nation is full of it. And God's wrath is poured out in judgment. Psalm 14, 1, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Me and Brother David were talking after the 8 a.m. service and he pointed out something beautiful. The original, go back to the Hebrew. If you read that in the Hebrew, literally it says, the fool hath said in his heart, no God. No God. The fool hath said in his heart, no God. And we're in a place now where people will openly tell you that they think there might be a God. Yeah, there, there might be a God. You might be right. But if he is who he is, then I hate him. And he can send me to hell. Do with me as he pleases. I've had more people tell me that in the last two years than I've ever had to say that in my life. Openly, radically. You tell him I hate him, one man said to me. Thank you again for being with us today. A very important time. And I want to speak from my heart to all of our friends. We need your friendship more than anything. And since we've been a ministry, we need your prayers. This is a pivotal time for our country. It's a pivotal time for this ministry. And it's an important time for God's people to stand together and to do what's right. We cannot allow a skeptical, cynical world to take away our voice and our stand together. God said in Genesis 12, 3, I will bless them that bless thee, the little nation of Israel. Isn't it amazing how six months after the brutal, bloody attack on October the 7th, all of a sudden Israel's the bad guy. We need to wake up, church, and I need you to stand with us. And please encourage your friends to go to ralphsexton.com, see the massacre of my people, and we also want to help you with some supplies. We have several different bumper stickers that stand with Israel. If you need them, just tell the person answering the phone when you call the 800 number. And then if you'd like to also help us with the Israel Fund, standing together, you can do that as well. Just go to our website. There'll be safe ways you can give online. You can call the 800 number or you can write to us today. We're counting on you. We're waiting to hear from you. I hope you'll pray for us. I hope you'll stand for us as we pray for revival in America and we join together to pray for peace in Jerusalem.